new coming generations who need uh, a culture that enhances their Islamic identity. And that is why it is very important to establish customs and to establish uh, traditions that are based on Islam. I'm not talking about establishing national uh, uh, cultures, if you will, but rather an Islamic culture that will uh, help our coming generations keep their identity and identify with Islam and its rituals and its celebrations. Inshallah Ta'ala, uh, that was a useful one, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Today, Inshallah Ta'ala, I'm going to uh, read a letter uh, that I got from one of the uh, our listeners here at uh, Zoom program. Uh, apparently a parent of uh, a youth uh, to start a new discussion. We're done basically with the social issues, with the gender relations. Uh, we had about eight or nine sessions so far. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll start discussing other uh, issues that pertain to our community and pertain to us as Muslims here. And uh, uh, this will be a good start because this is one of the letters. I, I get letters all the time and comments. And I want to thank everybody who sends in comments, uh, trying to make this program better with new suggestions, uh, you know, to improve. And uh, I appreciate uh, that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you. But this letter in particular attracted my attention because it is, it's a long one a little bit, but it uh, tries to deal with the root of the issue of uh, uh, the youth, and especially as it relates to our center here at the Islamic Center uh, of South Florida. And that's why I wanted to share it with you. And again, this is a discussion, an open discussion program. Uh, we tackle issues basically, we express our opinions, and we try to come up with suggestions and solutions. Let us read the uh, letter here. Uh, it says, Salam, Alhamdulillah, we have now completed almost two months of our Zoom meeting, uh, real issues. Jazakallahu khairan for all the knowledge and advice that you have been sharing with us. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to ask questions and for answering our questions. Thank you for your kind words. And this is, uh, this is my duty. It was interesting uh, to talk about how to get our youth involved and engage them in the masjid and community. Can you please advise us how to convince our kids to join in the community activities, especially the ongoing Zoom meeting of the center? Families that have been coming to the center and have been bringing their uh, uh, kids have reduced now in number. That is because of the corona uh, epidemic. The kids are still going to masjid, but just that they do not want to come to uh, this center anymore they somehow do not feel uh, that connection or relate anymore to the masjid. This also causes inconvenience to the parents because over the years, parents have grown attached uh, to the center, this center that is, and want to be part of the, this community. But the kids want to go elsewhere. Why our kids turning elsewhere? Why the kids love to come to this center only up to a certain age, maybe 12, 12 years and younger. But once they reach high school age, they tend not to be interested uh, in the center anymore. Some totally disconnect from the Islamic centers and some join other centers and they f where they feel or and they feel uh, more understood and will come there. I do not mean to blame or offend anyone. On the contrary, it's okay to blame uh, ourselves and, you know, in order to see where, you know, the mistake is, you know, if there is anything wrong to be corrected. Uh, it would be ideal if families can continue to be together as part of the same community. What are we missing? What is lacking in this community? Besides, we have almost 4,000 members uh, on our Facebook page, those are followers that the page of the Islamic Center on Facebook has, uh, and more than 2,000 members in our uh, Facebook group. While we have eight or more Facebook uh, groups, yet so far we have not reached even up to 30 participants in our weekly Zoom meeting. This is a virtual meeting, yet it is difficult to convince people and get them interested. 
due to the uh, pandemic, all the center's activities have been indefinitely suspended. Zoom meeting, real issues, is the only way to bring the community together to interact, learn, and share opinion and exchange views. What can be done to keep this going? That, meaning the real issue program, real issues. Uh, we appreciate your time and effort and the benefit uh, some of us are drawing from this program. However, we wish that more community members could benefit from it. And this program could bring the community together. Well, thank you very much. And you have touched on a very serious issue and a very serious, uh, 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 serious problem. And that problem basically is what is happening to our children, what is happening to our, uh, uh, to our youth. Uh, the issue here is not, uh, like you said, to blame just for the sake of blaming uh, people, but rather is to study a case and to study a situation and to try to come up with uh, a solution. Let me first of all emphasize the fact that Islamic centers are about religion and should be about religion. That is the nature of the Islamic centers, which means that they attract people who want religion, people who care about religion, people who think that religion is an important component of their lives. If a family does not consider religion an important issue, does not think that religion is uh, one of its uh, uh, important uh, things in their lives, most likely they are not going to come to the masjid. Not only the youth, but also the parents as well. If a parent does not think that uh, coming to the masjid, that religion is important, most likely he will not come to uh, the masjid. Part of understanding our, uh, our religion is to understand the importance of masjid and to have a special place in our hearts for the masjid. One of the seven people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will shelter in his shade on the day of judgment, وَرَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ أو الْمَسْجِدِ إِذَا خَرَجَ مِنْهُ حَتَّى يَعُودَ إِلَيْهِ One of the seven is a person whose heart is attached to the masjid. Every time he leaves it, he wants to go back to it. That is a true Muslim. That is a person who understands his religion. Even within our religious members, if you will, of our community, many of them will tell you, I'll perform the prayer at home. There is no need for me to go to the masjid. They do not put an extra effort, you know, to come to the masjid. And that's why we just said Salat al-Maghrib right now. We had 10 or 12 people who have performed the uh, uh, Salat. And that's for the other prayers, you know, it's the same. Some of them are even less uh, uh, than that. And those are not the youth. Those are those who were born Muslims and, and, and we have some converts as well, but mostly people who were born as Muslim and those who are supposed to be wise and in their uh, uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, okay? Still, they will tell you, there is no need for me to go to the masjid. I'll just pray at home. Those are the ones who pray and those who are religious, let alone the uh, uh, many people who do not pray to start with and who do not consider religion, you know, as a priority or uh, as something that is important or those part-time uh, praying people. Those who pray Jumu'ah only, for example, and the rest of the week, they will not perform one single prayers. Or those who care about their religion uh, during Ramadan. And after Ramadan, you know, they forget all of that. So the first uh, root, if you will, of the issue here or the problem is how we perceive our religion and how we relate to the Masajid. Are Masajid important to us? Do we make a special effort to go to the masjid and to uh, make it a part of our life? If we appreciate the masjid and we know the value of the masjid, then we start teaching our children from a very tender age the importance of the masjid. And we start making them uh, uh, attached to the masjid, rewarding them for you know, coming to uh, the masjid. I can tell you that there are some who do that but the vast majority doesn't. The vast majority, unfortunately, does not make attaching their children to the masjid a priority. Uh, uh, there are people who do not want their children actually to identify 
you know, with others or to be identified as Muslims. There are people who will tell you, I want my uh, child to grow up without an accent. I want him to speak pure English. I don't want him to mingle with, you know, speakers of other languages, for example. Uh, or they change the names of their children to make them assimilate easier, you know, in, uh, uh, in the culture. And they are not like others to know, you know, that they have a different religion, that they are Muslim, for example. So they change their names. These people are not going to come to the masjid anyways. They're not going to be attached to the masjid. Those who are going to be attached to the masjid are those who grow up in families where the parents themselves care about the masjid. The parents themselves come to the masjid. The parents themselves consider the masjid to be an important part in their lives. There are some communities, by the way, that are like that. The father, the mother, the son, the daughter, all of them go to the masjid every day, you know, to perform regular prayers, to be present when there are activities, when there are uh, uh, classes, for example. But there are some masjid, and our, unfortunately, our center is one of them, you know, where uh, in regular prayers, you hardly have anybody. During the week, you hardly have anybody unless some people are coming for some official business, you know, to get married or to have a divorce or to for, you know, counseling, you know, or things like that. This is the first uh, uh, leg, if you will, you know, of the problem or the issue. How we, perce we perceive uh, the masajid and what uh, uh, part they play in our lives, whether it is important or it is something secondary. That's number one. Now, regarding the center itself, Forget now the role of the parents. The role of the parents is number one. And this is the most important thing, how parents raise up their children regarding the masjid, whether they teach them to respect the masjid, to love the masjid, you know, to come to the masjid, or they uh, uh, do not. The second part are the masjid themselves. Our center, the Islamic Center of South Florida, was established from the beginning to be a community center and not to be only a masjid. You see how you define your institution and what you emphasize in your institution is going to attract the segment or the people that you are, uh, you are targeting. If an Islamic center is a community center and it attracts all members of the communities, then you will expect that everybody is going to come to the center. That is the natural result. Unfortunately, this did not continue in our Islamic center. In the beginning, we used to have families who would come to the masjid all the way from Bill Glade. And there are some families who are, you know, still uh, coming from these places. You know, they have good memories back in the uh, early 80s when the masjid was established in 1983 and uh, uh, from Miami and from all over. And they will meet as families and they will interact. Their children will play together and they will uh, ask about uh, uh, each other every weekend almost, there used to be a family event and, you know, uh, people coming from the Tri-County, you know, the Islamic Center. Remember at that time, we were the only masjid in the area here. You know, there was Masjid Al-Ansar, but that was a Musalla only, and there's Masjid Al-Iman, I mean. And there was Masjid Al-Ansar uh, 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 in Miami, which was a little uh, uh, far away. But the Islamic Center of South Florida was basically the only center, you know, in the area. And that is why everybody, you know, came uh, to it, and there were a lot of activities for everybody. When I came in 1989, most of the people, there were two people, two kinds of people, the community members who are the older uh, generation, and there were the young ones. The young ones basically were immigrants, people like me. When I came, I was 25 years old to the masjid, or 26, uh, no, actually 20, uh, 28, when I came to the masjid. I have, uh, uh, in my classes at that time, people who are in their 20s, people who are now in their 40s and their 50s, started with us in the masjid when they were youth, when they were, when they were young. Uh, I remember I used to go to uh, ICBR, I'm sorry, I, uh, Atlantic University in Boca Raton. And I used to give, every Tuesday, I used to give a class for the youth, the students who were in the uh, at the university. I used to go all the way to Miami, University of Miami, and give classes, you know, over there uh, and other universities. Uh, and in addition to uh, the classes that I used to give in people's homes, 
in my home, you know, and in the, and, and most of the people who were present in these classes at that time were younger people, people in the, mainly in their early 20s or in their late 20s, some of them 18 or 19 years old. That is how, you know, things have uh, started in the beginning. The gap that happened is that those people, when they got married, those very same people, when they got married and they have children, their children, you know, were not attached to the masjid from the beginning. Now, remember, we have a weekend school. Many people think that all that is needed of them is to send their children to the, I mean, Islamically. Uh, all they need to do is to send their children to the uh, uh, weekend school. Nowadays, we have full-time school. A lot of people send their children to the full-time uh, school. And I applaud those parents, by the way, who send their children to Islamic uh, uh, school. I forgot the name of the uh, uh, scholar who studied. He's a Latino uh, guy converted to Islam, and he's involved in Islamic schools. He said there will come a time where there will be only two kinds of Muslims left in the United States, practicing Muslims. Either a convert or a student who graduated from an Islamic school. Everybody else is going to melt, you know, and going to disappear. And he's right about it. Education is very important. The weekend school, if it does its, you know, uh, work right, might solve the problem partially. However, in addition to it, there needs to be activities for the youth. Uh, and that brings me to the third leg, if you will, of the issue. And that is the uh, uh, volunteers, if you will, or people who uh, can initiate and supervise and see youth programs. In the 80s, we used to have a brother I will mention his name. His name is Muhammad Sadar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him greetings and long health, long life and good health. He used to be a volunteer, you know, and he used to head the weekend school in 85, 86, you know, 87. Uh, but he at the same time took care of the uh, uh, youth group. We had uh, the Zaharat Club for the girls, where girls were involved in a lot of activities, uh, making uh, how to prepare from how to prepare food to making artifacts and uh, making exhibits you know in the social hall that we uh, uh, used to have and then uh, we have the boys and both were registered with the scouts and guys by the way uh, and they used to have uh, sports activities they used to do two camps uh, camping a year you know i remember one uh, place they used to go to is in davy you know that was good the, what we are lacking now is programs like that and responsible people who will take care of, uh, uh, of these programs. You see, you do not, uh, if the religious component, if you will, the religious motivation is weak, you can compensate that by offering programs that are attractive to, uh, uh, to the youth like sports programs, for example, uh, travel, uh, 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 things like that. Uh, you do not expect the youth all of a sudden to start coming. You know, the youth want to be there active. They need to uh, do things. We have a youth uh, group, by the way, but uh, up to now it's not, you know, functioning and doing uh, uh, very good. It does not have a, a large number, you know, and they, they meet only once a week. And because of the coronavirus now, I don't think that they are meeting you know, anymore. Uh, but that is the third leg or the third, uh, the third issue, to offer programs. One of them, for example, is to offer full-time school. You have a full-time school and a part of it is middle school or high school, then you're going to be dealing with the youth automatically. And then you're going to have youth programs uh, uh, automatically. We were the pioneers when it comes to Islamic education at the Islamic Center of South Florida. I remember we had a meeting in 1991. At that time, there were no Islamic schools at all. And the most of the representatives of the schools that are established now were in that, <laughs> in that meeting in the beginning. And we discussed how to establish an Islamic school. And, you know, after that, each one, you know, took their, uh, their own way. And we, alhamdulillah, we have now four of them, four of these Islamic 
uh, Islamic schools, but we should have our own, you know, at the Islamic Center of, uh, uh, of South Florida. Uh, we should have uh, a Quranic Institute where you bring young people in order to learn how to uh, uh, memorize the Quran. But again, if the families do not encourage their children, you know, to go to schools like that or institu institutes like that, that will teach them religion and they keep telling them, do not worry about that. We want you to become a good businessman. We want you to become a doctor. We want you to, and, and they put in their minds matters in this dunya alone. Because unfortunately, a lot of families, they keep pushing their children, but in this dunya, and not pushing them when it comes to uh, religion. They are very keen on secular education, that their children you know, study uh, engineering, for example, or study medicine, and they're proud of that. But hardly you will find a family that is proud that their child studied Islamic studies, or he went to uh, Al-Azhar or the University of Medina, for example, you know, in Saudi Arabia to study, uh, to study Islam, you know, or memorize. I'm talking about our community. I, I know that in other communities that might be uh, a little different, but in our community, hardly you will find a parent who will tell you, I'm proud of my son. You know, he is memorizing the Quran or uh, uh, he wants to uh, go to Egypt to Al-Azhar, you know, and uh, do Islamic studies after his graduate. Very rare that you can find you know, uh, uh, children uh, who are raised up to value that. Even, by the way, even back home, you know, the culture usually that is there is that if you cannot make it to become a doctor or an engineer or, a lawyer or, or you know, anything like that, and you're, you, get a, you got a very low score in your uh, high school uh, exam, then you go and study religion. You know, how do you find somebody you know, who scored in the 80s, for example, or in the 90s, going to the faculty of Sharia, of Islamic law to study, you know, to study religion. Usually they reserve it for people who uh, have lower, you know, have a lower uh, average. And that is unfortunate. The greatest scholars in our Islamic history were people who were very intelligent and they were very successful. You know, many of them in addition to their uh, specialization in uh, tafsir or in hadith or in fiqh, used to have jobs and businesses, and they were very successful in their uh, jobs. Abu Hanifa, for example, or other, you know, scholars, other imams, uh, they were successful both in, you know, in their careers and in, in this life, as well as in their studies, you know, in the Islamic uh, uh, studies. Right. This is just, you know, an, a quick overview. Uh, I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not answering questions here or trying to answer the question, but I'm trying to open our minds to uh, uh, new uh, realities, if you will, uh, to, to understand the issue of our youth better. If the parents do not get involved, a kid who is 13 years old, 14 years old, 15 years old, doesn't drive. If his parents are not willing to drive him, to bring him to the masjid, because they themselves do not come to the masjid and do not think that coming to the masjid is an important thing, the 13, 14, 15 year old is not going to come. It's, it's that simple. And if he doesn't come to the masjid, it's going to become part of his life. When he grows up, he's not going to come to the masjid, uh, uh, to the masjid either. And I know it is harder. Some parents tell me, they tell me we, we talk to our kids, but uh, they're not interested, you know, in, uh, uh, in the masjid. And I tell them it is because there is a gap in bringing up our children. We are, when they are little, five, six, seven, eight, ten, we teach them religion. We try to help them memorize surahs of the Quran. We try, but once they are 13, 14, you know, once they become, start to become young men and young, uh, uh, and young women, we leave him alone. You know, we uh, leave him to their peers and we leave him to their uh, friends, especially those who go to public, uh, uh, public schools, you know, and, and their new environment will not only help them forget the Islamic knowledge that they learned, the few surahs and few Islamic practices, but even to adopt un-Islamic, you know, behavior in these schools. So that is how it can start. The, the, uh, uh, there should be a comprehensive plan uh, uh, that will motivate the parents to come to the masjid as families, not as individuals, 
not to come the man, the old man, the father or the grandfather by himself to drive his car and come to the masjid and pray and leave. But rather to make sure that when I come, I want to bring my family with you. And I want to teach them to love uh, the masjid. On the uh, Islamic center part, it has to become a community center again that provides services for families, place a hall, a social hall for families to meet. For example, in the old center, we had that. Here, we do not have it anymore. Uh, we need to have programs as well so that the children can join. We have, like I told you, a family night on Friday where some come, but there is no program. They're roaming around you know, the uh, compound here without any organization or without any uh, program that is uh, attractive to them. So the Islamic Center needs to provide programs for uh, uh, the youth. They don't have necessarily to be educational all the time, you know, the religious education, but they can be sports, you know, for example, travel, uh, uh, camping, encouraging uh, hobbies, for example, uh, uh, pets, you know, and, and, and talking about uh, uh, things like that. Uh, having uh, 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 discussion groups among them where they can talk about their hobbies or about their lives or about their experiences and things like that. Uh, that is also needed. So it is a shared responsibility that all of us are supposed to be involved in and that all of us are supposed to chip in. Uh, I think I have talked more than enough uh, regarding this. I want to hear from you. You heard Dilatar, this is a concerned parent. And uh, I agree with everything, basically, that uh, they have said here. Uh, and like I said, I want to hear from you. If there are young people out there, you know, uh, unmute yourself and, and, and talk to me. And uh, this is an open program. You can say whatever, you know, is in your mind. We want to come up with suggestions, we want to come up with solutions. We don't want just to talk out about problems, you know, and that's it. There are people, unfortunately, who spread negative, uh, negative uh, uh, atmosphere, if you will, uh, that we are doomed, that, you know, I do not like that. Uh, try to come up with a suggestion. Tell us what you like, you know, as a young person, for example, what we can do, you know, uh, if you will. And parents, when you huddle, for, the, uh, for this Zoom program, when you gather for it, if you have uh, children or grandchildren, bring them with you. That's how we can get the young people involved in this and let them tell us what they want. You know, and I'm, personally, I am willing to, I am open to any, uh, 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 to any suggestion, but without doing that, that is, we are talking to ourselves. You know, uh, if we do not get uh, them involved as well, we will continue to do what we are doing, to, uh, talking to ourselves. Now, why don't people, uh, even parents, you know, uh, join us in this Zoom session? I don't know. From the beginning, we never had a large turnout. I don't know. We, uh, in, in the Friday prayers, for example, we have a very good turnout. Usually we have about 500 people who come for uh, the, uh, to listen to the khutbah on, on Friday. But it seems that some people, think that is all that is required from them Islamically. And beyond that, you know, they're, they're not supposed to be doing uh, anything. Think about your children. Think about what is going to happen to them when you are gone, when you are uh, dead. Are they going to continue to come to the masjid, you know, and make dua for you and you will get reward for them, you know, after your death or they're going to, you know, just forget uh, uh, the masjid. Taib, we have about 20 minutes. Let me see some of the comments that we have here. Again, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, say whatever you want to, that's fine. Okay. Please address the bullies in the masjid, particularly on the women's side. Oftentimes, when sisters try to come to the masjid to offer prayers in congregation, the senior members do not hesitate to criticize if a strand of hair is showing. They focus uh, on the appearance rather than allowing a sister to pray in peace in a house of worship. They also are very aggressive and physically uh, handling the ladies uh, as to where they want them to stand. 
it's hard to feel comfortable in that type of environment. They called and embarrass parents and their kids. They do not know, uh, uh, but do not yell at the children of the people in their social, uh, in their social uh, circle. I agree with you. There are some people, men and women, by the way, but I've been told about the woman side a lot, that there are some women, unfortunately, who do not have the akhlaq of the da'i. You are supposed, every one of us is supposed to be a da'i, an inviter to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a da'i is supposed to have akhlaq. And one of the akhlaq that a da'i is supposed to have is to be compassionate about people and to be kind to people. If you want people to uh, uh, listen to you, if you want people to follow your advice, advice, you are supposed to be kind uh, to them. And you're supposed always to look for nice ways to, uh, 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 to deal with people. Unfortunately, there are some who are not like that. There are some who yell. There are some who, uh, for example, uh, talk rudely to uh, other members and things like that. I have reminded the sisters, I, I give classes sometimes to them, you know, this many times. But this is what I can tell you. All the ladies, especially ladies who were born outside the United States, they were raised up a certain way. And they think that this is the way that you're supposed to raise up everybody in every environment. They do not understand that times are different. There is a, a, words, a word of wisdom that Umar ibn al-Khattab has said, to raise your children in a different way than you were raised up because they were created for a different time, like he says. That they were created for a different time than your, it doesn't mean that you, you know, they change their religion or anything like that, but it seems the methodology that is uh, used is supposed to be, uh, to be different. Unfortunately, this is a problem that does uh, uh, does exist. We have some, especially senior sisters, like you have mentioned, that are tough. And the way that they talk to uh, uh, other, and I have many complaints, you know, this is, you know, yours is one of them. I hope that they are listening, you know, now, and they can uh, uh, understand. I will keep emphasizing that issue and the importance of having the akhlaq of the da'i, inshallah, to them. Right. Also, I have here I believe we can learn from uh, Christian churches. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, always, we, 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 you're supposed to learn. It doesn't matter where the, you know, uh, you get the information from or we get where you get your models uh, and action uh, from. Churches have very good, useful activities, uh, especially the larger ones, uh, as they have uh, well-structured and interactive programs for their youth. Perhaps we can uh, pay them a visit and consult. Let us learn the good things from others. That's a very good suggestion. Uh, I went to a few churches and participated in some of the activities uh, of some churches. The uh, church is a different culture. Uh, for example, one church I went to, uh, I looked at the, uh, it has a lot of uh, people who are in charge of things. For example, they have a treasurer who is you know, responsible for an accountant, I mean was responsible for things like that. A secretary, you know, that sits in the office every day and answers, you know, the question. They have actually two of them, they rotate. You know, they take uh, a thing. They have a coach, a sports coach. Uh, they have a musician, you know, and a chorus and things like that. And when I asked the pastor, how come that the church can afford all of these? Guess what? He told me all of those are volunteers, all of them are volunteers. Unfortunately, we criticize the Christians, you know, many times that they are not religious enough. I mean, not all of us, but some of uh, Muslims, unfortunately, criticize the Christians for not being religious enough. They do not know that they do more volunteer work on average. A, a Christian person does more volunteering in, in, uh, for religious education and social than the Muslim, number one. Number two, an average Christian contributes financially to the church more than what a Muslim, the average Muslim does. Some churches, you have to pay 10% of your, of your gross income 
in order to become uh, uh, to become a member. So uh, you're right, they are there, but they have a different, uh, the, the volunteering for them uh, is not like volunteering to us. Here volunteering, some people think that it means uh, I just do it for, you know, for fun. If I want to, I'll do it. If I don't want to, I don't have to do a good job because I'm being paid, I'm not being paid anyways. This is the mentality that we have here. Over there, it is different. A volunteer means a professional. I am a professional accountant. I have retired from my job. I need to come to the uh, church. I will put 20 hours, actual hours. I will come, I will register that I came at this time and left you know, at this time. And I want the church to give me at the end of the year a voucher or a statement that says I have donated this much you know, of uh, uh, work, work this much for money at the end, you know, at the end of the uh, year. We do not do that. A volunteer to us is somebody who comes, you know, and does uh, uh, what he does. And it's up to him. If he wants to do it, that's fine. If he doesn't, you cannot ask him because, you know, he's uh, is not getting paid for that. Uh, we have a lot of questions. That is true because this is, a, a you know, a very, apparently a very hot subject. Inshallah ta'ala, we have more uh, sessions, you know, to talk about if we, we do not address everybody's uh, uh, question. Right. So we can learn from uh, uh, from churches, uh, but learning from churches is not at the level of the administration only, but also at the level our Muslim individuals need to learn from the Christian individual uh, uh, volunteers, you know, as well. Right. <clears throat> I believe we can, okay, here we have, uh, just so everyone knows that the boys, young Muslim groups, meet over meet up every Friday night. They have a halaqa followed by discussions, alhamdulillah. This has been going on, uh, has been going on uh, since the COVID situation started. Uh, it would be a good idea to advertise this via mail, email, uh, so, other, so that other boys can, that's great. That is good. If you are meeting, uh, I don't know where you are meeting. If you mean you're meeting uh, on Zoom or uh, online or physically or how? I know that before the COVID-19 on Fridays, we used to have a group of our youth meeting every Friday. And that was good. I, I mentioned that. It needs to uh, become more organized and to have more activities to attract more number. But nonetheless, I commend you for that. But do you mean that you are meeting now uh, on Zoom or online? If you do, we can help you. You know, in advertising that because we have database for uh, uh, more names and uh, phone numbers. Type. Uh, please address the bullets. Uh, I think we mentioned that already. Why do you think we have a large turnout for Jumu'ah? I'm not in, uh, 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 into a, any other lecture on the Majid. I, I think I mentioned that. It's because we came from cultures, most Muslims uh, who I see on Fridays came from cultures where they think that their Islamic duty is to go to Friday on Jumu'ah. The school is supposed, as teacher at the school, especially the religion teacher, is supposed to teach their children their religion. That is the, the, the uh, mentality that, uh, uh, that we have. Um, this is a different, a different reality. Here is not back home. Here you are supposed to indoctrinate your child with the Islamic aqidah. You are supposed to bring him to the masjid. If you don't, nobody else is going to teach him. If you leave him to the school and uh, peers, especially again, if it's a public school, you're destroying him. You're not you know, making him any uh, uh, good Muslim. So people come to Friday and they, because this is you know, what they think is what is required from them. And beyond that, it is the work of the mom. You know, it's not the work of the father. I, as a father, I have done my, uh, my responsibility. You have not. Uh, as a father, you're supposed to bring your boy when he's 13, 14, 15, and you yourself come to the masjid. And you have to make the effort to come to the masjid, which means you have to change some of your plans. You have to go out of your way in order to make time for coming to the masjid. And when you do so, bring your children uh, uh, children with you. you know, if you do not do that, you know, your children are not going to grow up attached to uh, uh, the masjid. That's, ba that's basically what, uh, what it is. All right, do you think, or maybe this can also be brought up on Fridays after the khutbahs, because here we are a small amount. You're right, 
we can discuss that at a larger, um, uh, you know, at a larger scale, uh, including the khutbah as well. We can send, I can send uh, messages on the phone, longer ones, like in the form of a long letter, for example, explaining to people the importance of, you know, bringing their children to uh, with them, you know, when they come to the masjid. The problem, like I told you, is that we're having a problem with the parents themselves coming to the masjid, let alone the, uh, the children, the parents themselves. I don't know, we're becoming so uh, uh, immense, if you will, in our uh, uh, materialistic life, our jobs and making money and, you know, uh, competing among ourselves when it comes to this dunya, cars and, you know, uh, expensive uh, wedding parties. And that's what people think about. And that is what people care about. And that's unfortunate. At the same time that they are doing this, their children are growing up, you know, away uh, uh, from the religion. Uh, I have this in Arabic here. Musabakat akthar shi kan yaqudna ala al-jama' في البلاد زي المسابقات في رمضان ممكن تعملوا family night we do مسابقات we have brother أبو ياسر when before the COVID-19 if you remember those who used to come here we used to have the Kahoot program every time but in order to have the مسابقات in order to have these game uh, these games, if you will, we need people, you know, who will participate. طيب, Assalamu alaikum, brother. Can you please tell us what is the function and responsibility of the Imam in the Islamic Center in the USA by comparison uh, to an Islamic uh, country where function may be just to lead the prayers and do the Jum'ah khutbah? Uh, can you please shed light on this subject? Jazakallahu khayran. The um, uh, role of the Imam in the United States depends on the institution or the establishment that he is in. There are different forms, if you will, of Islamic centers or of masajid in the United States. There are some centers, for example, that are near universities where most of the crowd that comes is students or are students. And I uh, was a student myself and I used to attend a masjid in Pennsylvania near the university I was uh, going to and their atmosphere is totally different because 90 percent of those who are present you know are in their 20s you have some masajid uh, that are more involved in the uh, uh, as community like i said our masjid when it was you know started uh, uh, in the beginning there are masajid that are based on a certain idea like quranic masajid if you will the imam is a hafiz and he uh, teaches, he focuses on teaching Quran and make, making uh, uh, memorization uh, uh, of the Quran. You have uh, 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 others, for example, that are uh, uh, more into matters of da'wah and inviting Christians. And, you know, uh, they are more of da'wah centers and their activities, you know, focus on that because of the locality that they are in or the situation that they are in. But generally speaking, the role of the Imam in the West in the Islamic centers in the West is more complicated, uh, more difficult, and involves more activities than the Imam uh, back home. I come from a family where everybody almost, you know, many are involved in, uh, some is a mufti, some is an Imam, and some is a khatib, you know, and uh, and so on. And, and there, when they ask me, what do I do, what, you know, compared to what, uh, what they do, they're astonished because <laughs> they don't think that many of the things you know, that I do is the work of the Imam. For example, uh, counseling, marriage counseling. Uh, marriage counseling is not the work of, you know, the work of the Imam, it's the work of a counselor or solving problems or judging amongst people, you know, when they have uh, uh, disputes, financial or, you know, that is the work of the judge. Uh, when people ask uh, uh, fatwa, especially when it has to do with inheritance and things like that, that is the work of the Islamic uh, judge, Qadu Shari. He's the one who deals with uh, issues like that. When it comes to funerals and, and, and uh, preparing janazas and things like that, that is the work of somebody else. Marriage and divorce, you know, that is the work of the ma'loon, uh, what they call over there. The uh, imam over there basically leads the prayers. That is the job of the Imam. Even the prayers over there, you have the Jum'ah prayer, usually there is a khatib. 
His job is a khatib. All he does is the khutbah. There is a mudarris who gives classes, sometimes uh, Quranic tajweed classes or, you know, or things like that. Here you have to wear many hats, you know, in order to cover uh, uh, all of these uh, these areas. You have to be a, a counselor when it comes to counseling. You have to be a ma'zoon when it comes to marriage and divorce and things like that. You have to uh, 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 be an imam when it comes to reading the prayers. You have to be a khatib. You have to be a mufti. Uh, you have to be a consultant. A lot of people, you know, ask for nasiha or for you know consultation regarding uh, 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 regarding many things. In addition to that, you have to represent the masjid and the media. And you have to do the da'wah outside. I go to churches and I go to universities and I, you know, I give lectures all the time. I participate in activities, you know, with the county or with, you know, with the uh, city and, you know, all of these things. So the, the role of the imam is more comprehensive. And that is why, like I told you, there is more demand for volunteers in the masajid in the United States because the role that the Islamic Center plays or is supposed to play, you know, is a huge. Uh, uh, we are the Ministry of Awqaf, and we are the Ministry of Qadr Qudra, and we are the Ministry of Education, and we are the Ministry... Well, we, we, we cover a lot of activities, you know, for uh, the Muslims. We're supposed to, uh, uh, like I said. And that means that the Imam alone, uh, it, it will make, it'll put a lot of pressure, if you will, and, and he will not be great in every aspect, because you're a human being, and the end uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, fight on 20 fronts, if you will, uh, at the same time. So, um, it's like I told you, the role is more comprehensive and more complicated here in uh, uh, in the West. One point before I depart from this point, point here, because it's important, there is a need to grow uh, uh, home here in the United States imams. And, and that brings me back to the subject of the youth. Because if you do not encourage your children to study Islam, I mean officially to become an imam or to become uh, a mufti or to become a, you know, a scholar in uh, Islam or to become a hafiz or anything like that, uh, you're going to end up with people like me. In the, in the future, you're going to have to import somebody you know, from Egypt or to import somebody from Jordan in order to come and do the religious duties because nobody uh, here you know, uh, who was born here it was interested in, you know, studying, uh, uh, you know, Islam. And then again, you will have the problem of a gap that you have between the culture that this person came from and the culture that the people are here from. It's very important to encourage our children to uh, uh, study Islam and to be uh, more active. Taib, assalamu alaikum, brother. Okay. How can an imam make a difference. It depends on the imam, basically, uh, it depends on the role that he is given to play. In most centers, uh, our center, let me talk about it, the imam is supposed to take care of the religious matters. Religious matters means the umors, the, such, the, the uh, subject of fatwa, the subject of giving classes, the subject of uh, prayers, the subject of uh, Ramadan programs and things like that. When it comes to other activities, educational activities, sports activities, and the imam can participate in them, but definitely they need somebody, you know, who isn't you know, to be in charge, uh, uh, to be in charge of that. Uh, which again brings us to the subject of volunteerism. I've been try to, trying to make committees, you know, for a long time. Those who are with us. Uh, since we moved here to the new masjid, uh, trying to find helpers in matters of da'wah. We have a da'wah committee, we have a youth committee, we have a financial committee, we have social committee. The social work alone is a whole department helping the poor and you know, visiting those who are sick and uh, uh, you know, uh, kids with uh, special needs, for example. There's a whole department you know, that needs the effort of, we need to cooperate. There is no thing that the imam can do all of these things. There is no imam that can do all of these things. Some imams, like I told you, they specialize in one aspect and they excel in it because that's, they, that's what they do. They are not willing to do marriage and divorce. They are not willing to do janazah. They are not willing to do anything, but they are willing to make tahfidh of the Quran, for example. 
you know. And uh, they excel in doing that because that is their field. Okay, at our center, we offer uh, a wide range of uh, services. My kids and I love to go to the masjid uh, and socialize with the Muslim community. However, there is something called a click among some some group of uh, groups of families that have some youth left out. I'm not sure if I understand. My kids and I love to go to the masjid and social with people, socialize at Brown Pew, the Muslim community. However, there is uh, called a click among some groups. I, uh, if I understand you right, I think you're saying that there are a group, some group of families who like to stay together and they do not like outsiders. If that is what you, uh, uh, what you mean, uh, that is a problem. Uh, and I think, you know, it does exist. People who are relatives usually, or people who are from a certain country, you know, or people who are interrelated uh, to one another, usually to hang out, uh, you know, with, uh, with one another. Uh, this is something that we can uh, talk about, inshallah. Like, the time is over. Apparently, there are more uh, comments that we need to discuss. It's very uh, clear that we touched on a very hot subject. Alhamdulillah, that's uh, good, and that's what we want. Try to encourage others uh, to come. Inshallah Ta'ala will continue next week with the same subject so that you know what we are going to be talking about. And, and again, uh, try to express your opinions uh, freely and come up with ideas and suggestions. Barakallah feekum. Inshallah Ta'ala, I will see you next uh, week and I will continue to answer the questions and the comments uh, that I did not answer this time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.